Well, let's welcome Sean as he brings the word tonight. Amen. Thanks so much. You guys can be seated. Wow, man. I, well, a couple things. Number one, I'm still a little wrecked from worship. Was worship powerful or what? That was truly special. There was a sweetness that just came in. I don't know. Maybe I was a little late to the game, but about maybe halfway through worship, there was just a sweetness of God's presence that came in. So, and when you hit those spaces, you just feel like you could stay there forever. Some about the presence of God that was just so incredible like that. I, I am excited. I hear that the women had a phenomenal time last night as well. My goodness. And of course, I'm a homer, but I will admit, man, I'm telling you what, my, my wife, she seeks the Lord. That woman prays. And so when she gets up and talks, uh, whether it's in the pulpit or we're just having, you know, husband-wife conversation, she carries the wisdom and just the heart of the Father and prophetic. And I love, love, love. I've seen it. Many of you have seen it. But I really love, like, on a national, even now international level, a real recognition of the prophetic gifting and office that she, she walks in. And I'm her, I'm her biggest cheerleader. I'm like, yay, come on, go, go, go. So I'm super excited about that. Man, pastors, John and Grace, they are amazing, right? I mean, seriously. We had some uh, good lunch and some good convo, and we had good convo yesterday because we did the podcast. But as we were talking to them, I just thought, number one, how blessed we are to be friends of theirs. I mean, they're a kick. They love the Lord. They're prophetic. They're visionary. They're, they have the heart of the Father. They're revivalists. They're, I mean, apostolic. You go down the list. But here was one of the big ones for me. They're personable. They're warm. They're funny. I like that kind of stuff. You know, a lot of times you get around super anointing people, and you get in the green room, and you're just like, man, I think I liked you better before we sat. And I realized, you know, I'm not mentioning any names. I'm just, you know, but that is not your pastors. They are really incredible like that. Come on, yeah, give them a hand. They're amazing. Love you, bro. Seriously, love you guys. Pastors Dan and Terry, thanks so much as well. They're always such a, uh, first of all, when you're around them, you, you feel the greatness, the depth of the authority in the spirit. You feel a father and a mother, which I think anytime you feel a father and mother, you just want to like ooze in their arms because they give such great hugs. But literally, I, I, you guys have, are blessed at a very, no, no, no. There's blessed, they're spoiled. Y'all are spoiled. <laughs> to have that kind of legacy right here in the house and sure love you guys. We do have some resource out there. Uh, we, we got some, I don't know what you call these. Do you call these truck, you don't call them trucker jackets, do you? Or what do they call? What? Coaches jackets, thank you. Where we've never been before, Momentum. We, we had a conference called Momentum, but uh, I've had a couple prophet friends of mine say, you know what? Sean, I don't know if you know this, but that is the word that God is speaking for this next season, momentum. And uh, the movement times movement or movement that keeps moving is momentum. I forgot what that is. But we've got jackets out there. We've got hats out there. I'm going to give this back to my wife here. So that's out there. And then we've got some USBs. This is 24 hours of teaching on the prophetic activation. Uh, it's just a, a, a school on a jump drive on words of knowledge, how to hear the voice of God. The Bible says we prophesy according to faith, how to build up your faith to hear the voice of God. Uh, just, oh man, I got to look at it. I'm forgetting all the different teachings on it. Uh, a person of the Holy Spirit, uh, how to activate spiritual gifts. Uh, there's six teaching on prophetic evangelism, how to sanctify your imagination, uh, because that's key, because I, I was talking to the Lord one time, and I said, God, with all the teaching on the prophetic and the activation, the maturing of that office, why in general aren't we more prophetic and more discerning? And there are probably a lot of answers for that. I'll just tell you what the Lord uh, told me. Uh, the, best, the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. And I just felt the Spirit of the Lord tell me, if you will take care of the purity of your heart, I will take care of the clarity of your revelation. And And... If we would admit it, I don't know that we've stewarded the, the purity of our hearts well, but we're learning. We're going to get there. Amen. You guys agree with that? And then we've got a, another one on the prophetic ministry of Jesus, which is a video I did for Randy Clark when we spoke 
for Randy. And so sharpening her spiritual senses, a bunch of things. I'm going to give this away, 24 hours of teaching and a book. I forgot about that. Did I tell you too? There's a book that is a sequel to, to Eric. Do you have this, Eric? Well, then you got it now, brother. Bless you, man. Come on, come on. Kristen and I, like right in the new year, I, this, this is exciting. I just like to talk about this kind of stuff. We are, in, in a sense, we've seen two collective sets of crutches abandoned. The first one was we were with university students, and we've been receiving prophetic words about university students, and I cut my teeth in ministry and witnessing to university students, and I still speak there. I got some grays in my afro, but they will still listen to a brother, so I will still talk, okay? And so we had five states of college students. It was Hawaii, California, uh, Arizona, and uh, uh, Nevada. And 450 of them met in uh, Northern California in Santa Cruz area, and so we were preaching, and all of a sudden, we just begin to sense the Spirit of God moving us in the area of prayer. And so we begin to pray, and uh, a word of knowledge went forward with a girl that actually had crutches. Well, had some co-ed students buy her, lay hands, and pray for her. She drops her crutches, and she begins to take steps. I guess she had a six-year deteriorating uh, leg condition that affected her knee on one side and ankle. I think it was an overall bone thing. She drops it. She starts walking. She starts running. Well, I hear the screams going over there. So I'm like, hey, come on. Come up here. Tell us what's going on. She comes up, and I said, well, bring your crutches with you, right? She was running up. She didn't need it. She holds her crutches up. And she gets healed. And I said, well, what couldn't you do that you could, you know, you could do now you couldn't do before? She throws her crutches down, jumps off the stage, and starts running back and forth. And I'm like, I love this, right? I love this. It was so powerful, this true, true story, right? A, a five-point Calvinist reform dude that was there, that he was a college student invited, he comes up to me after seeing that, and he says, I guess I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I guess I'm Pentecostal like y'all right now because God does this stuff. And then at our Momentum Conference, I, I think the person was from the Pacific Northwest, right? From Oregon. And so a guy had crutches there. We all saw him. If you're at the conference, you imagine if you're here in a conference, you'd see someone. And all of a sudden, in between worship, right? Like in the beginning of worship, some people gathered around and prayed. Next thing I know, I'm hearing a praise report, and I see crutches on the altar. And this dude's running around, praising God, jumping up and down. So we're, we're going to do a little Amy Simple McPherson. We're going to put them crutches up in our office, man. I, I want an entire wall of retired crutches and walkers in Jesus' name. How many of you love when God does that kind of stuff? Oh, man, amen, amen, amen. All right, we're going to jump in this. And if you have a Bible, if you'd go to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20, and uh, I, I'm going to read a couple of verses. We'll jump down after reading verses 1 and 2, and then we'll read verse 18 through about 22. All right, 1 Samuel 20, I'll read it to you, but if you got your iPhone, your Bible, that other phone, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You know, people are like super evangelists for iPhone, and like they make people feel bad. I would never do it. What's that other phone outside of iPhone? No, I'm kidding. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. It says, And David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? If you know the backdrop of the story, right? Uh, King Saul is, is uh, jealous, demonized, has some issues. He's a first uh, elected, if you will, or appointed, not elected, first appointed reigning monarch of Israel when they moved from judges, transitioned into a monarchy. Uh, he was uh, anointed by the prophet Samuel. God allowed the people to choose. They chose this guy, uh, David is now developed a bit of a reputation. He's being cheered on. Saul gets jealous. He gets these demon fits, and it's just not good. And so there was a chapter, and he threw a spear, a couple spears at David. And so thus the questioning, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Now, verse 2, never, Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. Now jump down to verse 18. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new, new moon feast, which is essentially a, a celebration that they would do based on the, the new month, right? A new month, a new moon. It says, you will be missed because your seat will be empty. 
the day after tomorrow toward evening. Go to the place where you hid when this trouble began and wait by the stone Ezel. Say Ezel. Look at your other neighbor. Say Ezel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy and say, go find the arrows. And if I say to him, look, the arrows are on the side of you, bring them here. Then come, because as surely as the Lord lives, you are safe. There is no danger. But if I say to the boy, look, the arrows are beyond you, then you must go because the Lord has sent you to way. I want to talk about this thought of the arrows are beyond you. One of the things, and I was mentioned to the men that uh, Krista and I have gotten a chance to sit with some prophetic types and some high-level intercessors, and I say that to kind of bring you this word, somewhat of the consensus of, of what a lot of them were saying. I mentioned to the men, one of the things that we begin to see is consistent in the body of Christ and how this is a season of exposure, Right? A season of exposure. It wasn't just Weinstein, wasn't just Epstein. Come on. It's all the folks. It, judgment begins in the house of God, and also we're seeing it out in the world. But the other theme that came up was this aspect of wartime, us being in war mode. I would actually use a terminology. I believe that we're in the season of the crucible. And anybody understands the crucible you might have been a little bit more vocal and give me an amen and shake your head. But maybe a way I can say, how many of you experienced some extreme warfare? How many of you have been hit with some thoughts and some things that are relentless? How many of you have battled with health situations, finances? You have felt some breakdowns and some intercommunication with family members? How many of you have felt the breath of the enemy, right? But the crucible is interesting because it isn't just what the enemy is doing. Is what God is doing in the midst of your warfare that makes it the crucible. Somebody say crucible. crucible. I believe that we're living in a time when the body of Christ is being tested, it's being sifted, it's being examined, and hopefully approved because God is about to do something in a minute in the North American church, and he's readying us. And so I don't want to give too much credit to the devil. I want to acknowledge that I believe the enemy is doing what he does, but God is disciplining us and bringing us in a place where we can be entrusted with the more, and that excites me. Because I would say this as well. I don't think it's just the season of, you know, like unusual warfare, which we would say. I believe it will be a season, listen to me, of unusual warfare and unusual spoils. You don't understand that terminology. That means folks are about to get saved. That means prodigals are about to come back home. That means somebody has been in deconstruction, is about to get in some reconstruction. I believe the Lord is going to begin to woo hearts, and we're going to see massive people, and the spoils are coming back. Now, what is it, is the thing, Sean, that we should have not brought into 2024, because we always have New Year's resolutions. We're always talking about the old is gone. We're in a new season, all this stuff. Let me tell you what I think. I'll, I'll humbly submit this. I believe the thing that you and I were not supposed to be dragging around and get out of 2023 with, and I believe all of the challenges were about this. You ready for it? Okay, all right, Noma's ready. Noma, we'll have some coffee, Eric and Chris, and we'll talk together. No, no, okay, I'm going to tell you all. The thing that we should have not gotten out of 2023 with is self-sufficiency. All of the things that took place, all the stuff you're hearing on the news, on wherever you get your current events, the situation in the Middle East, the situation with the economy, the situation we're in an election year. Come on, somebody. The Lord is teaching us that we need to be delivered from self-sufficiency. The illusion that we would have the answer, that thought, the, of kind of this humanistic sense that I could fix it or we can get the right person in the White House and I'm all for voting, I'm all for like being biblical on a vote, protecting the sanctity of life, etc. But if we think that simply piercing a chad on an election card is going to be the answer, we have missed it, somebody. The Lord cursed is the man that leans on the arm or depends on the arm of the flesh. Get delivered. God is trying to graduate us out of a self-sufficiency, which is really going to be an insufficiency, into his all-sufficiency, which is a God-sufficiency. 
y'all get me fired up, right? Coming to the end of the road of self is a blessing. It's a blessed realization because when you come to the end of the road of self, what happens is the realization of our helplessness becomes the basis of the best education anyone could have. All of a sudden that I say, God, we need you. My nation needs you. My family needs you. My church needs you. My community needs you. And that desperation and that cry that says, God, we're not looking to what we can produce becomes the most glorious release throughout church history of what happens when God shows up. I was blessed as a believer, a baby believer. Somebody handed me Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know if you've ever read that book. I normally don't do. I want to ask, how many of you have read Fox's Book of Martyrs? All right, I'm just going to say something because I, I see mostly us older folks. I want to repent to every Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and maybe even some millennials that we have not discipled you well. I'm talking about the greater body of Christ, not necessarily here at Sunrise, because we should have turned you on to this important piece. Fox's Book of Martyrs taught me a vital lesson. And this is Sean Smith's quick statement when you read it, because Fox's Book of Martyrs are first century early church believers that spilled their blood for the gospel. While we have a generation that will stop and walk away from God over a spiritual hangnail, we had people that we are a part of a spiritual legacy, a spiritual lineage of people that would not hesitate to give their lives. I mean, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's one dude that he's going to be tortured by Nero, and he saw his wife, because he wouldn't deny Jesus, his wife is, is martyred, his children are martyred. Can't even imagine if you're, you're a father and you're seeing this, and as this dude is going to be martyred, his last statement is, alas, I wish that I had a thousand tongues and a thousand lives to give to my Savior, but alas, I have but one. I'm reading this as a baby believer. I'm wrecked. But you know what it did for me? Listen to me. I I began to realize two things. Number one, my life and laying it down is a weapon. Right? You you recognize that, right? They overcame them by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. And then part three, we never quote too often. They love not their lives unto death. Hello, Fox's Book of Martyrs. You really want to be an effect and impact change. You, you got to be willing to die for what you believe. We got to get back to this stuff. No more of this easy believism. No more of this Christian consumerism. This stuff that, God, you didn't do what I want, so I don't know if I believe in you. I'm mad at you. I withhold my worship. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, <laughs> you come from a spiritual heritage of people that hung, that were sawn asunder. They were dragged by chariots. They were dipped in tar, lit ablaze, while others were fed to lions. And all the while, Christianity flourished. Come on, you can't counterfeit that. Right? Here is what I did. I got to tell you, as a baby believer, somebody hand me the book. I told you, I tell you, this was my vital life lesson. You ready for this? Here it is. In order to push the forces of hell out of the way, you have to be more determined than hell itself. That's what I realized about these early believers, that they pushed hell out of the way because they were more determined than hell itself. The Lord is about to bring back our grit. Come on, somebody. Somewhere on the line, body of Christ, we lost our grit. North American believers, at least we'll say that group, us, we've lost our grit. And, but I believe the Lord is about to bring our grit back. And when he brings our grit back, we're not going to be holding our tongue for fear that we may get some unkind emails, or we may not be popular, or we may lose some followers, or what we say may not trend. We're able to speak the truth, and the good thing about truth is it represents Jesus. And number two, truth sets folk free. Come on, somebody. Not your opinion, not what's trending, not what they're singing in that hip-hop song. I'm telling you what sets you free. Truth. To withhold the truth is to withhold someone's freedom. Oh, come on, come on somebody. Yo, uh, I'm getting too fired up. It's something about being in this pulpit. I know John gets fired up. I believe when you adopt this mentality, this grit, you will always push through hard times and take significant territory for the kingdom of God, irregardless of your season. Here is what it says in verse 1. It says, then David fled Naoth at Ramah, and he went to Jonathan and asked, 
What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father? He's trying to kill me. And you see these questions that kind of is a, a picture for a moment of a David that we don't get preached at very often. We know the giant killer. We know the one that went and, man, exacted revenge on those that struck his camp at Ziglag and brought back the spoils. But a guy who is questioning things right here, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father? Why is he asking these questions? Let me answer that, but stop, hold the phone for a second. Let me tell you this thing. Probably about 15, 20 years ago, my, our daughter Brittany, uh, she had a health crisis that kind of went, and part of it was we began to realize that uh, because of her autoimmune uh, uh, battle that she needed to go gluten-free. Now, today, and I want to emphasize that, today you got some great gluten-free, for that matter, healthy options. They actually taste better. 20 years ago, gluten-free was nasty. Okay, I'm just going to say that. I don't know if you've ever done that. 20 years ago, man, let me put it like this. When I was growing up, my favorite, one of my favorite sandwiches was a spaghetti and meatball sandwich on Wonder Bread. That has so much gluten in it, that would kill four kids today. Okay, I'm just saying, right? It's a, it was a, it's one of them back-in-the-day jokes, okay? First time I ate a gluten-free biscuit, my tongue ran to the back of my mouth, <laughs> fell down in a seizure, then got up in a protest and blocked the passageway to my throat, not allowing any more gluten-free stuff to go back down. Y'all should not even been able to call that thing a biscuit. It was nasty, nasty. I don't know what that is. You ever eaten gluten-free food? I mean, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, gluten-free food? You know, one time. Okay, thank you. You ever eaten gluten-free food from back then? It needs some gluten. Okay, that's what I, that's my conclusion, right? I ate that. I'm like, this needs some gluten. Whatever, I'm not even sure what gluten is. I think it's a glue stuff. It needs some gluten right now. I don't know what gluten is, but apparently it's delicious because when you took it out, that old taste thing went, it died. Sometimes you don't realize what role gluten plays in foods, right? Cornbread, for instance. Cornbread is the not, not, it's not the most structurally sound food to begin with. When you take out gluten, which is kind of glue, it's like biting in the sandcastle, right? Like, Moment you bite it, that stuff just goes back to where it looked when it came out of the box, right? It just, that's how it looked like before I added water to it, right? My conclusion, <laughs> my conclusion, my first gluten-free experience from gluten back in the day, it's better than now, was this simple thing. You ready for it? When I eat it, I would go, they left something out. I believe the North American church has left something out. You come to services that are more reflection of a man's nature than God's nature, they've left something out. When we feel we have to wow you with the special effects we can create rather than wait on the miraculous effects that the Holy Ghost would have, we left something out of the service. When we've got to time it in such a way where people get bored and we got to get you out in 33 minutes and do a quick song thing and a Dominus Omus bless you and get you out and it all ends not in a Holy Ghost but a hug your neighbor break, we've left something out. Come on, somebody. When we all of a sudden twist the gospel to fit the aberrant behavior of folks and not preach the gospel and let the word say what it's meant to say, let you know there is a God that has an anointing that can break the yoke. We got something for witchcraft. We got something for gender fluidity. We got something for your addiction. Come on, somebody. We've left something out. If we've not told you about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if we've not told you about how to cast out devils, we've left something out. And I'm telling you what, the glue that would hold it together is not gluten, but it's ghost, Holy Ghost, and we have left something out. 2024, I'm telling you, it's time to go Holy Ghost or go home. That we, you, North American church, oh my goodness, y'all get me too fired up. David left something out. I told you I'd answer the question, why is he asking so many questions? I submit to you the reason why is David left something out. And I'll prove it to you. The Bible says, and we read it in 1 Samuel chapter 20, David left Naoth in Ramah. 
There was a precious minister, I don't know if you know Brother Rick Howard, wrote a book years ago on the judgment seat of Christ. He named his ministry Naoth. And I want to begin with Naoth. Naoth had in David's point just a chapter earlier, but it says right in the first verse, David left Naoth and Ramah, in Ramah. So he left these places. Naoth at that time, look at me, had the highest concentration of prophets on the planet at that time. The prophet Samuel, none of his words fell to the ground, had a prophetic school in Naoth. David left Naoth. It represents something. But he also left Ramah. Ramah was Samuel's hometown, the prophet Samuel that anointed and, and prophesied David in terms of being the next king, the next reigning monarch. Ramah means high place. It's often used to apply to a, a military stronghold. It represents, let me put it together, when I said David left something out, when he left, and I'm using it as metaphors, when he left Naoth and Ramah, it's literally by definition, he left a position of authority and a prophetic space. I believe the North American church is asking questions because we've left our place of authority. We, uh, okay, Sean, say it. Okay, I think I'm going to say it. We have preached where we have left the absolutes out. We have left discipleship out. And we wonder why a generation deconstructed underneath our message. Some of that is on us. We left something out. We didn't give you the root system. We didn't offer disciple. We wowed you and we hipstered you and we gave you a cute little Instagram moment to take a picture with a celebrity pastor, but we didn't disciple you. And woe on us, we left our remark. We left our position of authority. We left the prophetic space. And if you notice the moment David left these two places, he immediately begins to struggle. Why is this going on? What have I done? What's going on inside of me? Let me tell you some warfare truths, right? I believe that today many Christians have adopted a humanistic view of things. What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. They do not realize the spirit, spiritual implications of what's going on in their lives. And let me just say this. Your unwillingness to engage in battle doesn't make the battle go away. It just ensures your defeat. Come on, somebody. I think we've walked away from our positions of authority. I'm going to say it. I know y'all love me and I get to keep coming back, so I feel confident just telling you. You know what I think we did? I think we think, and as a church, if we elect the right person, that is the, you know, the move of authority that we need to, we need to get the right person sitting in the White House. And please hear me. I believe it is important. But understand something. You are seated in heavenly places. What's going to shift the church? What's going to shift a nation is not who sit per se, who's seated in the Oval Office, is who's seated in heavenly places. And I think when the church went like partisan, political, spirit political, right? I think we lost a level of authority. We're asking some man or woman we put in the White House to do what only we could do as the church. See how my voice did, did that Michael Jackson kind of puberty thing right there? I hate when that happens. Feel like I got to set my man card down for a little bit and pick it back up when I get this kind of voice right here, all right? I think we went overly in that direction because we acknowledge we've dropped the fumble, the ball on our authority. That you recognize the authority. The true authority is not the Oval Office. It's not the Pentagon. It's not, that's not the seat. The true place of authority is the prayer room, right? Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. We abdicated our authority, folks. That's what we've done. Now, here, here's what I, I'm going to put it together. The other thing is we left the prophetic space. And, and yes, signs and wonders, but just letting the word have a sword. Let the word cut. Let the word come. Why would I want to soften the blow of God's word, right? Because the same scalpel that cuts off the cancer, right, is the same one that can do surgery, that can open up my heart and allow God. I want the truth. I want someone to speak the truth to me. We're having casualties left and right because we no longer have truth speakers, 
and if you're if we, we, we if we won't speak the truth, what will happen after a while? And here's where we've gotten to in the world. The world wants their opinion coming out of your mouth. If you don't speak truth after a while, you're going to speak consensus. And we need to be people that speak from conviction, not speak from consensus. We need to get back. We left our Ramaz and we left, man, our Naops. And we got to get back to that, folks. I felt like the Lord helped me sum it up this way. The modern American church who will not follow the finger of God will cease to become the finger of God. I was in your state years ago. I was a young evangelist. I was doing teen camps, and I forgot where it was at. I just remember it was cold to me as a California boy. And as I was at this camp, and I think it might, it might have been a, a winter camp or something of that sort, we were there, and a girl, I, it was pretty evident to me. I'm a young believer. I mean, I'm, you know, single digits, you know, in, in the kingdom. I look at this girl, and just from being in campus ministry and having to deal with it, seeing it before, but seeing the power of God, she's, she's, she's manifesting a devil right now. And immediately, two older youth pastors, I don't mean to be poking at your state, this could have happened in California, the Lord knows it could have happened. These two youth pastors go, oh no, because I'm saying, hey man, we need to minister, deliver us. Go, oh no, she doesn't need deliverance, she just needs her meds. True story, two older youth pastors. And for a moment, I could feel, I'm not saying the devil was in them, but I could feel the devil use that mentality to kind of go, Sean, what are you doing, man? You're catastrophizing. Like, let the girl in, let her give her, she, after the service, give her her meds. But there was something in it, it was like, no, this girl needs to be free. It's not okay. You just keep medicating her, giving her more drugs to dumb her up. Not dumb, intelligent, but you know what I'm saying? Trying to take the edge off. And so I just went over to this girl and I saw this spirit of Jesus anointing come. As I came over, she began to manifest. And these dudes thinking they need to get meds. No, you need to get some anointing, Jack, right? We come, cast the devil out of this girl. And it was glorious, but it did cost me. Can I tell you? Right right in the last demonic thing breaking off of her, she caught, I didn't see it coming. I'd have got out of the way, right? She honked up this yellow, white, it was solidified, hunk of loogie. It looked like a big old nasty marshmallow to be chewed up by your dog, Fido. This thing flew out, and it was like slow motion. I'm like, no. I had this new shirt. I love that shirt. You ever get your shirt? You found your shirt, and it lands, and it goes splat. And it was a white shirt. I pulled that shirt off immediately. I'm like, I'd have burned, I'd have ripped it off me. Good thing I had a t-shirt underneath. I, I didn't even, you know, somebody said, did you get it and wash it? Heck no, they got demon loogie on it. I'm never going to put that shirt on it. Go burn that thing. Throw it in the trash can, right? I paid a price for her deliverance. I just want to know. I know Jesus gave the greater price, but I'm, I'm no, no, I'm just kidding. Youth pastors came up to me and they're scratching their head. And they go, oh, I believe the North American church is about to have an oh moment. I believe we're about to have an oh no moment. But what happened is someone on the line, those two guys cease to follow the finger of God. And when you cease to follow the finger of God, you cease to become. The Bible says that by it's, if, if a devil's being driven out from you, it's by the finger of God, the supernatural. But see, if you're not, if you're not in your naoth, you'll lose your ramah. If you're not following the finger of God, you cease to become the finger of God. And this is what has happened. If, if there's ever, listen to me, if there's ever been a time to take extra time to hear the voice of God, to begin to develop an inner history where you know where God's voice sounds like it's now. More than ever, it's not enough to hear from your favorite YouTuber, podcaster, preacher, whatever. You tune in, that's good, be fed by that, but don't let it replace your ability to get still before your Savior and hear your thus saith the Lord. We gotta have our naos. David left naos, and when we leave that, that's when we begin to question. How many times have we questioned God? Why did that happen? Why did that occur to me like that. What's going on here? I don't know where you're at, but we don't wait for the answers. It's kind of a questioning, kind of a verbal complaining, but we don't take the time to listen. And I think what happens is this is what I arrive at. This is where we're at. Right now, the reason why you need to hear from God is your revelation must be greater than your resistance. 
I'm going to say that again. My wife says so good. So if she says so good, then that gives me permission to say it one more time. I'm going to say it to this group over here because I just feel like God is a God of a second chance. I'm going to give you one more time. I believe that we've entered into a season where your revelation must be greater than your resistance. Because if not, and I'm coming back to this side, if not, the enemy will use your anxiety to invalidate your prophecy. Not like a couple spears being thrown at you to feel a little anxious. And all of a sudden, wait, 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 wait. Didn't the prophet say you're going to be the next reigning monarch of Israel? The crankiness of one dude throwing some spears at you and the spears didn't hit you, but the enemy is now using anxiety to invalidate the prophecy. Are we the most prescribed in terms of anxiety med generation to ever hit the planet? You don't think that there's a demonic agenda and extra hordes from hell to try to get us anxious. And here's a lot of, I think, what's going on in David. I, I, obviously, I'm coloring in some things. But when he began to question like that, I think he had some anxiety going on, right? Anybody else feel like that too? David, to me, doesn't seem like himself, and I think I've, I've talked to a lot of believers, and because of the warfare, because of the uncertainty of the times, because we want anchors, we want to have the knowns, it's the unknowns right now, and I just want to stop and say this, I believe that God has taken us to a place we've never been before. I'm convinced that the worst thing we could do is simply try to Xerox the patterns of what God did in the past and how we did and moved and operated in the past. My, my, it's starting to happen to my computer now, right? After a while, it, it begins to age out, and then I hate Apple. Can I just say I got a, a love-hate affair with Apple is that they'll change uh, the operating system, and so your old Apple won't operate on the new operating system, forcing you to drop a thousand plus dollars to get the latest is coming out. Then they're going to change how you charge it because they want to add more money to that, right? I believe that God is dropping an operating system that your old spiritual Mac is not going to be able to handle if it is not upgraded by getting along with God, getting in the Word, and being reconnected to the heart of the Father. David doesn't seem like himself. You ever wake up and not feel like yourself? I don't, it's rhetorical. I believe, and you guys are a mature group, so the numbers may be smaller, but I believe there's a large number in the body of Christ that if they got honest, they don't feel like themselves. I don't feel like myself. I'll, I'll, I'll throw myself, you know what? I, I don't, I'm not at this place now because I'm a middle-aged black man. I'm not growing any taller. But I remember as a young teenager going through growth spurts and I would get awkward for a moment, right? Anybody like that where you, you, you're a little more close? Anybody closer to any growth spurts? Do we have anybody? Okay, no one, no, y'all not here. All right. Gangly, I, I've always coached basketball. My kids playing up. Grew up playing basketball and kids would trip over themselves and all that stuff. I, I feel a bit of an awkwardness because I feel like God has caused me to grow from what I, where I was and I'm kind of relearning a rhythm in God. Now, again, I'm not talking about necessarily my time alone with the Lord and my devotional life, but just how to cooperate with what God is presently doing. And I would submit something to you, and, I, and there, there are much more spiritual people than I in the room, and I'm sure there could be a counter argument and thought on that. But I think if you're not feeling awkward in the least little bit, it may be because you're too dependent on the way you've already done it, and you've not really interfaced with what God is currently releasing. David doesn't seem like himself. He seems overloaded. He seems overwhelmed. He seems overcome. How many of you know we live in a society where we overbook our calendars? Anybody wave? If any of these apply to you, just wave, okay? We feel overloaded in our emotions. Anybody ever feel overloaded in their emotions? Just Grace and I and a couple, okay, a couple other folks, okay? <laughs> Anybody ever feel like you? Come on, Grace. We would throw a hand in the shoe right now, right? Come on, girl. Anybody ever feel overworked in their bodies? Come on, somebody like that. Could use a vacation. See, law come on. Any feel like some of it, <laughs> any of it, a cruise to the Mediterranean. You get a cruise. You get a cruise. You get a cruise. Take on Paul's journeys. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, you are the, you are the culprit in your own business. Anyone overprogram their days? Come on, somebody. And maybe you, you just get a, a little bit 
I don't know what the word is, but you, you, you're kind of optimistic you could get all that done, but you don't realize that after that appointment, how worn down you would be. And it's just like you're losing ground with every other appointment after it. And after we overbook our calendars, overload our emotions, overwork our bodies, overprogram our days, then we make the mistake of overvaluing their opinions. Anybody ever overvalue a person's opinion, right? Not all opinions are created equal. Let me just tell you that, right? And in doing so, we overlook our spiritual and emotional health. We're overcome by the weight of all, it all. We feel overwhelmed by the expectation demands. And maybe that's where David was at at this point. Let me just say this. The enemy wants to make being overwhelmed the new normal. It's still early in the year, folks. Listen to me. This is this first several days of February. It's our time to get plugged in and get rejuvenated. It's our time to say, you, you kind of thought that the new year would come and everything would just immediately change, but we kind of went in new year and some of the changes that are taking place really don't look that good, right? And it may get crazier. I'm just saying. I'm not even trying to be prophetic. I just have a feeling it's going to get more crazier. And more than ever before, you got to understand something. You have got to recognize that God has allowed the things around you for you to dive in desperation to reconnect with the heart of the Father and the mind of Christ. Being overwhelmed, they say that feeling of being overwhelmed. I remember I said that the enemy wants to make being overwhelmed the new normal. The feeling that we are overwhelmed and in over our head, that right now the people that study mind sciences, science says that that overwhelmed feeling affects you got to hear the whole statement, one out of five of us to a paralyzing degree. We're not talking about how many people feel overwhelmed. We're talking about how many people feel so overwhelmed they shut down. Right now today, one out of five, 20% of North Americans are shutting down, paralyzed because of the feeling of overwhelm. And look at the backdrop of this. This is the backdrop of political activists promising us global peace. Come on, somebody. Good luck with that. We see military forces are vulnerable. There's even some bombings and some situations of people that have done against our, our, our army, our you know, military forces. We see economic systems that are shaky today. We see natural love disintegrating. Come on, we're not just talking about international terrorists. We're talking about kids walking up on school and walking in the malls and beginning with military rifles to begin to open fire, even churches. And it's not just the terrorism out there. It's now the terrorism in here. We see that families are turning in on themselves. Even the earth itself seems to be rumbling and with an increasing frequency of earthquakes and natural disasters. And here is all this stuff. And where do we find David? I'm going to throw this in on David. I don't think it's just questioning. I think it might even be second guessing. You ever get to the point where you second guess yourself? You know, I found out the most confident people are often sometimes some of the people that second guess themselves the most. I remember one time I was in a store and it said, the idiot's guide to assertiveness. We're talking about being confident. And I remember looking at the book and some people think, man, I wonder what they said in the book. No, I, here's what my thought was. I thought, my God, the last person that needs to assert themselves is an idiot. <laughs> no, don't get that book right. <laughs> Idiot's God to assert them. No, no. If you're an idiot, don't assert yourself. Okay, just saying, right? <laughs> Noma got it. Come on, Noma. Noma. David began second-guessing his situation. And I feel right before God is about to launch you into a new thing, the enemy brings up an old attack to second-guess yourself. He tries to get you stuck in this negative voice of negative expectation. It could be subtle, it could be loud, but it begins to undermine the things that you know are true. He tries to call into question the promise that you're holding on. Will that son or daughter ever cease being the prodigal and come back to the father's house? Am I going to see healing for my spouse or my kids? Are we going to actually get to the point where we get some breathing room? And it's a crippling, withering voice this, this thing that tries to get you to drain dreams before they ever happen. Why? Because here's the principle here. Your perspective affects your pursuit. The enemy was trying to stalemate David's pursuit because your perspective affects your pursuit. So many times people feel like, I'm stuck, Sean, or feel like 
man, I'm, I'm kind of just coasting in my walk with God, whereas I know I want to be full throttle, pedal to the metal, going after God. What happened is, what's happened to my passion? What's happened to my drive? What happened? And, and I submit to you, you sometimes think it's a heart issue, and if it's sin, if there's something in your life that's a heart issue, you repent of it, you're back, amen, Jesus forgives. But I say more often than not, it's perspective. Paul says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving in us an eternal weight of glory far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. Unseen is eternal. I, I read that, and you know what I think? I think what Paul is saying is, this is a Sean stat, I think 85% of warfare is your perspective. That if you would see the promise of God, you would see the face of Jesus, you would see the smile of the Father over your life, you would see like through the eyes of faith what is God has already made available. I believe that so much of the battle would be over because here's the principle again. Your perspective affects your pursuit. Come on, this is so important. Say it with me. Say my perspective affects my pursuit. Look at your neighbor. Say your perspective affects your pursuit. Hmm. So what is heaven coming to do for David? What is heaven coming to do for you? Heaven is coming to turn your question marks into an exclamation mark. I can see the Spirit of God. You see, you know, the curvy figure of a question mark. I see the Spirit of God's hand just jerking that thing. And where there's been a question mark, God is going to turn those question marks into exclamation marks. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's what's about to happen for David because that's what happens. David has a dilemma. Okay, here's a dilemma. Definition, you know what a dilemma, dilemma is, right? Dilemma is a situation requiring a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. It's like a dilemma is I got two rows in front of me and both of them are bad, right? That's a dilemma, right? Because let's think about it. He's there. He has what to him would see, seem like the better. This is your better perspective possibility or possible outcome is that I'm going to go work for a man that has thrown two spears at me already, that demons are playing musical chairs. As long as I play the harp and worship God, demons come off of them. But like that little kid game, when the music stops, the demons come back and sit on this dude. And man, who knows what else he might do? He has hired mercenaries and hired folks to, it is bad. And then he's married to King Saul's daughter, Michael. And although she's kind of trying to help him out, she has got some issues herself, right? It, but to David, this is the best possible outcome because that's home. That's where I've been. I'm familiar with that. I'm comfortable. I know the battles. I know the devils. I know the toxic folks. I know it. And so the tendency is I'd rather stick with the known than to go into the unknown. Hello, North American church. This is where we're at right now. I think David wanted that. I think that was his preferred outcome. That was his best. Somebody say dilemma. Because here's the other option. Be on the run and be a fugitive outlaw and leave your family. So all of a sudden, he recognizes this whole thing. And, and I love this because David pretty much is stuck, right? I know this has made a comeback. And so this might apply to a younger generation as well as an older generation. But how many of you know or have vinyl records? Come on, just lift your hand if you know. Come on, I, I love this. Come on, y'all, I love y'all. Come on. Got anybody else? When I was a kid, I had a, I had a record. I know what the record is. I'm not going to try to sing it because I'm a horrible singer. But somehow, it was a nice record, and it got a, like, scratch in it. Like, not like mixing, not, not that kind of scratch, right? A scratch like it had a groove in it, and so it would come to this place in the song, and it would repeat the same thing over and over and over again ad nauseum. It was maddening. And so all us inner city kids in Oakland, we doing a soul train. I don't know if y'all don't know about soul train, but that's all right. All right. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I was about to do a soul train. I'm not going to do it. All right. Stay, stay, stay in the anointing, Sean. Okay. And so we're doing the Soul Train line, but then the record would stop and scratch and keep saying the same thing over and over. So we knew what to do. You do. You know what to do. We would do a collective jump, or we would come and bump the table, and it would get out of it. But unfortunately, I love the record so much, didn't have enough money to go ahead and buy it. I just knew it had two scratches in it, so we'd play a little bit longer, and I'd begin to move towards the record player, and it's going to get stuck. It would get stuck again. I feel like for some of us, God is trying... Uh, I don't want to say God is trying. He's successful. He's purposely bumping the North American church to get us out of a groove we've been stuck in. He's allowed up. 
a little bit of shaking to go on because that's sometimes what it takes to get us out of the groove. You're stuck in stuff, and when you get stuck, <laughs> think about this. All right, this is, this is kind of jest, but kind of true, right? You ever been stuck <laughs> in a conversation with someone you couldn't get out of it? All right, y'all too holy for me. Nobody, <laughs> nobody had that but me. It's just me. It's just me. I'm the only person, right? You don't have to raise your hand nor raise your neighbor's hand. You ever been stuck in the same grade a couple years? Okay, good, good. You haven't. Maybe you felt stuck in a mundane, ordinary job. Maybe you feel stuck in a spiritual rut where you're doing the same things over and over again, and you find this rub, this, this thing where there's a, a, a cry that you should be moving forward. You believe you can change. You believe there's something better on the inside of you, but you just keep falling into the same old habits and patterns. I believe, and now I'm going to move to this thought, I believe that you're on a stone of Edzel. Remember we said Edzel. Now here is the thing, and I'll recap so I can bring us all to speed. David is trying to decide, do I stay or do I go? Do, 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 do. Do I stay or do I go? Who, who is it? Somebody tell me, who's the group? Y'all don't know that group? I thought somebody, y'all are really holy. I love that. Whatever, that song, do I stay? This is David, do I stay or do I go, right? And so he happens to sit on a stone at Ezel. And him and Jonathan come up with the idea, Jonathan, I'm going to go back to my dad and I'm going to find out for real. Now, my dad is mad at you, and he's going to take you out. I'm going to come out, and I'm going to, I'm going to be I'm like I'm doing target practice with an arrow, but I'm going to shoot the arrow. Then I'm going to say to the dude that's assisting me getting the arrows, I'm going to simply say the arrow is beside you. That means, David, it's safe. Come back home. You're good. My dad is, he, he was tripping, man. I don't know what's going on, but he's going to be all right. He said, but if I go there and I find out my dad is still, he wouldn't use the word, but we would use the word maniacal and demonized. I'm going to shoot the arrow, and I'm going to say to the lad, the young guy that's fetching my arrows, I'm going to say, the arrow is beyond you. But David, we read it in that verse. He's at the stone of Ezel. You know what Ezel means? You ready for this? The word Ezel means departure. God has... It goes without saying, the Lord is prophetic, y'all, right? The Lord has David on a stone of Ezel. It means departure. It means, if you will, it could be loosely said, a place where you would launch. For all intents and purposes, the stone of Ezel is a launching pad. I believe, sunrise, you are on a launching pad. In the spirit, you're at a Cape Canaveral moment. It's the T minus nine, T minus eight, T minus seven, T minus six. You can hear the fiery engine burst of coming out of the bottom of the missile. I believe that God is about to launch you to a place you've never been before. I believe that so many things that have tied us down, the Lord is about to cause this, this launching power to begin to break the things that have held the church back for so long. He's at the stone of Edsel. What are you doing on a launching pad trying to find a comfortable place? I had some extra sounds going on in the back. I love little kids in the service. I don't think you got that. What are you doing on a launching pad still trying to be tied to a comfort zone? God has put you on a stone of Ezo. You can't go back. By, you're, you're on a stone of departure. We want comfort zones, especially when we see all the shifts and changes and all the things that are, that are question marks going on in our world today. We felt like we've used up our adaptive energy during the whole COVID thing. We don't have that anymore. And the tendency is to want the familiar, want the comfortable, want to do things the way we all do things. And even worse, we become museum keepers. We feel it's our aim to keep Stuff the way it is. Now, initially, it's cool. You're commemorating old moves of God. You're bringing in remembrance the different points that God has done things in our history. Amen, amen. But sometimes the museum keepers move from just trying to keep you to remember the past to where they try to keep you in the past. You can't do that when you're on a launching pad. Come on, church. I read this article blog. It was called The Art of an Exit. You ever read a blog or an article and they go, they get me. 
they did get me, all right? Because they asked the question, what's your skill level when it comes to leaving? They call it the art of an exit. I don't know about you personally. I don't go anywhere without thinking about how I'm going to leave. Okay, maybe that's just me, right? I'm in a restaurant, I'm looking at the exits, right? I'm on a plane, I'm looking at the exits. I'm in a place, in a bank, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on whoever walks in the bank, and I know where all the exits are. I don't know if it's the inner city Oakland thing. I want to know how to get out if it gets crazy in here. Anybody else know and kind of, okay, I got some help here, right? I love you. PCW, right? P, that's not right now, PCW. PNW, Pacific Northwest. There we go. I think that sometimes you have to have a strategy of getting out of things. I was reading this article at a Taylor Swift concert. I think it was at the uh, Nissan Stadium. And obviously, she's popular because she's a popular, uh, gifted singer. And she is being seen a lot on football games because Kansas City is doing well. And she's dating one of the guys. I, I read this thing that at Nissan Stadium, I think it was because of weather-related, they had to ask everybody to go in a locked up place in the stadium and halt the stadium. I, I guess part of it was open and part of it was covered, but they rushed people. And so they kept them in there so long waiting for the thunderstorm or whatever it is to pass that people actually were trapped and they were locked in there. Like that would not work for me, okay? I'm, I'm probably not a Swifty, okay, just saying, right? I'm, I'm not trying to get out of Swifty. But you know, my biggest thing is I just need to go to bed. So I'm gonna find my exit. I don't know why. You are not gonna keep me in here. I'm gonna find a way out because that's just how God just built me, right? Anybody else? The art of an exit. I think we have to learn how to exit old seasons better. I don't know if we're good at exiting old seasons. I don't know if we're, we're good at moving on from things where God moved before. Praise God for the Nehustans, that, that American Medical Association thing that when the Israelites complained that there was a brass serpent placed on a pole and Israel looked at it, they were healed. But in the time of Hezekiah, it actually had become a distraction. So what earlier represented healing and life to people of now keeping a people from revival because it was after Hezekiah broke Nehustan that the revival broke out. And I felt like what happened is a nation of people didn't understand the art of an exit. Church, we got to learn how to exit stuff. Because you can't enter something if you don't exit something. Come on. Okay, come on, Sean. Preach that, boy. That is a good word right there. Oh, my goodness. That was a good word. Oh, man. Cycles of breakthrough will never be created in your life. Cycles of breakthrough will never be created in your life as long as you're comfortable in old seasons. Learn how to exit. You can't get caught. You, you, you're not going to get the breakthroughs you desire if you keep being stuck to the old. Now, again, I'm not talking about old. Like, there are things we're going to always do. There are, there are church traditions. There are stalwarts. There's devotion. There's worship. There's all that kind of stuff. I know there's this progressive Christianity stuff out there, and that's as complimentary word as I could find for it, that thinks they need to move on to the new, but their new is moving off Scripture. That's not the new I'm talking about. How many just wave? You hear, you hear your speaker. Amen. Okay. Here it does. Why? Why is it important? Because there comes a point that when you want new wine, you got to quit drinking old wine. And right now, I think that the tendency is for many of us to get stuck swimming in old wine when God is pouring out the new wine. Now, let me just get back to David. David's freaking out. Oh, man, what did I do? I can't believe. Oh, man, I don't understand. Did I do something too bad? Oh, he's, he's trying to... In all intents and purposes, he's freaking out. But can I say something to you? It's not the time to freak out. It's the time to find out. Lord, shoot the arrow. Where is the arrow landing? My eye is on the arrow. I know it's on my eyes on the sparrow. My eye is on the arrow. It's not a time to freak out. It's a time to find out. It's a time to get revel revelation from the throne. It's a time to ask the question simply of the Lord. I'm not going to simply do what seems right, because one of the frightening scripture is a way that seems right unto man, but his end is destruction. I don't want to do right now, maybe the most dangerous thing we could say, is it seem good to me? No, that's not going to cut it, Fred. Come on, somebody. We got to move beyond what seems good to us. I'm not, I don't know if anybody's Fred here. I just use Fred, Okay. <laughs> We, we got to say what seems good to the Holy Spirit and maybe after that, and then us, as they said around that table, I believe is in Acts 13. Here is directional intel was the arrow's placement. And here is this 
situation? Was it going to be comfort and what he was comfortable with and used to? Or was it going to be this fugitive hiding and desolation? It all came down to this secret code. And I'm almost done. I just want to say this. What I have observed to be the distinguishing characteristic of successful churches from those that are not as successful, from breakthrough Christians, from those that have breakdown. Can I tell you what I believe my observation is on that? You would say maybe the power of God. And you would not be wrong. I, I wouldn't argue with that. You might say the resources of heaven. It's often good to have the resources of heaven. But based on this passage and what I read, can I tell you what I think is what separates successful churches from those that are not quite as successful, breakthrough believers from those that break down? You ready for it? It is perception. When you're able to see what God is doing so you can step into what the Father's done, you John 5, 19 and 20 did, right? The, the, Jesus said, I only do that which I see the Father do, and that which the Father does, the Son does likewise. Father loves the Son, shows him all things. He himself does him, will show you greater things that you may marvel. If we can perceive God, where are you sending us? If we could perceive God, I got a divine appointment at Starbucks. I'm supposed to win that barista to the Lord. If I could perceive that that wasn't just kind of a, some sort of coincidence in my day, Lord, you're giving me a highlight that I'm supposed to pray for that person. This could be the moment this person gets up out of the wheelchair and starts dancing all over Walmart. Come on, somebody. And not just like greeting you, but greeting you with the word of the Lord. If I can perceive, Paul perceived that a man that wasn't able to walk, he perceived he had faith, and he said, rise up and walk. The perception is what turned that moment into an open moment of, of being able to preach to the people of Lystra and seeing a turnaround. If we could perceive, somebody say perceive. perceive. If you could see what others are blind to. In that moment, God was giving David, and if I can get someone to come to the keys, God was giving David a fresh perception into something he had already prophesied. Saul can't kill you. The, Saul, the spirit of Saul can't take down the spirit of David. The key of David, right? The, the, the blessings, the prophetic words. And, and you have to be able to see and look beyond the satanic setback to the divine set up. You have to be able to see that. Now, let me jump down and give you, all right, I, I'll give you this because I know you're hungry people. We always tell you what to look to. You look to Jesus. Can I tell you what not to look at? You're on a launching pad, church. This is what not to look at. I'm going to go quick. Number one, don't look back on the world, right? Remember Lot's wife. <laughs> she looked back at Sodom. That's not a good thing for Mrs. Lot's wife. She turned to salt, and I guess when stuff burned down, some of the scholars said it looked like white ash. She looked like she became what she beheld. Now is not the time to look back at the world. I don't think it's this group, but I remember some guys, it got rough when we were early believers. We, we had pledged a fraternity, and some of the guys that had given their life to the Lord were getting teased, and people were looking at us differently on campus. I used to be a DJ, and so I would DJ parties, but now I'm not doing that. I'm not even going to the party because I love Jesus, and, you know, I, I remember some guys that were talking to me. They go, Sean, we're, we're, we're kind of concerned. You may backslide. And I'm going, backslide to what? Go back to that old sorry bar, play that sorry old game, do that sorry thing, trying to pick up. That thing almost killed me or made me want to kill myself. I would never turn my back on Jesus by his grace. Don't look back at the world. Because when you're on a stone of Edsel and you're going through overwhelm and feeling stuck and questioning and wondering in the midst of we've got prophetic words about uh, a revival, we got prophetic words about this, and I'm hearing the words of the third, uh, you know, the third world war, World War III, but we cannot allow wor words, prophetic words about World War III to blind us to the third great awakening that God is going to send, the billion soul harvest. So in that time, don't look up at the world. Don't deconstruct. Don't do all that stuff. Number two, I said, number one, don't look back at the world. Number two, don't look at your circumstances with fear. Peter, you're walking on water. What does the storm have to do with that? Like, keep your eyes on Jesus. You'll keep moving in the supernatural. Don't look at your circumstances with fear. Stuff is going to happen this year, situations. Remember, the arrow went beyond them. 
that, can I just say this of David? The arrow landed in an unexpected place. I feel like this year the arrows may land in unexpected places, but we're not going to look at our circumstances with fear. Number three, don't look at the enemy only. Don't look at what the enemy is doing only. When Elijah had his servant and all he could see was the Syrians covered the mountain, alas, my master, we're going to die. That's King James for we out right now. It's bad. And what did he do? He prayed for him. He said, Lord, let him see. And he opened up and he saw angels and there was way more of them than there were, which leads me to the truth. Don't look at the enemy only. I'm telling you what not to look at. Number four, don't focus on the fault of others right now. It's a waste and it only allows you to play into the accuser of the brethren. Right? The Bible says, why are you trying to get the log out of your brother's, uh, excuse me, why are you trying to get the toothpick out of your brother's eye with a log in your own eye? Right? I don't think it uses, you know, it's like, you got a big old Duraflame, you're trying to get the toothpick out. Right? No. Like, don't focus on the faults of others. And then five, as crazy as it seems, but not crazy, it kind of full circle, don't look to the arm of the flesh. Don't think that we can do this by some sort of thing that we can rally, we can pull together that leans on flesh. We already told you Jeremiah 17, 5, curses the man, uh, curses the man who trusts in man, makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord, because that's what happens. When you get into self-sufficiency, your, your, your eyes. Now, let me say this. The arrow is beyond you. It's time to turn from Bible information to Bible encounter. The arrow is beyond it. It's time to allow overtime worship services and overtime uh, word and overtime altar calls and get the, the egg timer or whatever that thing is off the pulpit. It's time to literally say, I'm going to get before God. The arrow is beyond me. I'm not going to try to do what I've always done. I'm not going to just, they said the average North American Christian prays two minutes a day. I don't know if that, that's changed, but I heard that, and I, 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 I'm like, if you, blessed three, if you blessed your food three meals a day, that's your prayer life? Are you kidding me, right? You don't think the arrow is beyond you if that's your prayer life. The arrow is beyond you. That literally, you've got to say, man, the arrow is beyond us. God hasn't called us to do what seems possible, reasonable, normal, attainable. The day of normal church is over because the arrow is beyond us. The demonization of a culture has come to the place we can't play church. We can't just mail it in. That's, that's coach talk when you coach kids. Like, okay, y'all got a great record, but you can't mail it in. You're going to go out and meet these kids on the soccer field and beat them in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I mean, come on, somebody. And body of Christ, we, we, we how, how would I say this? We've been given victory, but you know, we got a generation of believers. I'm not talking about young people. I'm talking about believers. We've been given victory, but we want victory without a fight. And eh, don't think that's going to happen well for you. The arrow's beyond us. The arrow is beyond us. The arrow is beyond us. God has called us to step into the impossible, step into the outrageous. God, I want something on me that the unbeliever looks at me and goes, Sean could not have pulled that off by himself. The arrow must be beyond him. I'm telling you, I think there's a generation of people that would bust our door downs, but our brand of Christianity doesn't look extreme enough to them. And if we did it, they would come in. Barna has already said that Gen Z is the open generation. More of them are asking questions about Jesus than the previous two or three generations. And here's what I'm saying, and we do close. Uh, the arrow is beyond a pre-programmed church. The arrow is beyond a quiet church. The arrow is beyond a best life now that doesn't have a cross life now embrace church. The arrow is all beyond that. The arrow is at a point now where we have to say with fresh abandonment, God, I'm ready to launch into a new space in connecting with you. I appreciate my history. I'm not, hear me, I'm not poo-pooing on our history. I thank God. I wrote, wrote a book on it. I really love history. I'm a history revival move of God buffed. But I can't live in the antiquated pages of what God once did if I'm not simultaneously believing for God to do that and greater in my day. The arrow is beyond that. And can I tell you the end of the story? And I, I am done. Uh, but it wouldn't be fair to not tell you how it ended. How did it end for David? He would know the arrows beyond him. He would leave. But what would happen? He would become victorious and fleeing from Saul. 
He would become the leader of the greatest band of soldiers that Israel ever had, the 300 that met him in the cave of Adullam. He would rule Israel as king in their brightest days. He would become a worshiper and write a book in the Bible. Hello, somebody. He'd become a psalmist. He would gather the materials to build the temple. He would be honored and revered the rest of his life. He would be known as a man after God's own heart. Church, we're going to get there. We're on the stone of Ezel. We're asking questions. God, what's going on in the world? What's going on in the Middle East? What's going on with nuclear weapons? What's going on in the economy? What's going on in the, the election of North America? What's going on in China? But I'm here to tell you that God still has his church. Despite all your questions, God is letting you see that the, the arrow beyond you because there's a mission and a calling and a demonstration of God would you bow your heads <sighs> Jesus Lord I just thank you God I thank you for the Spirit of God that's all across this place and father I believe that you're speaking to your children in most incredible way of calling us out of the ordinary out of the common into the uncommon that God we're not called to nominal Christianity. You're calling us. The arrows beyond nominal. The arrows landed in phenomenal Christianity is needed in this day. God, the typical is not going to do it. We need a, a, a stereotypical or a typical. We need something that's beyond that altogether. We need a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. We need a fresh weeping and wailing at the altar. We need like literally, and, and again, please don't hear this as works. Uh, it's not works. It is keeping in step with the Holy Spirit and obeying him and having the most unqualified yes. In other words, there's no quantifier, qualifiers we put on our yes. God, yes, if you do, if you do this, then God, okay, then I'll do that. No, 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 we, take, we took all those off and we're saying, God, the arrow's beyond us. We believe, God, we would be the group of people that you could find in Pacific Northwest that would say yes, that we know that we're on the launching pad. We're on the stone of departure. God, you're launching this house and these people into something new. That God, that in a moment, I believe that we're going to be gathering our armies, God, we're going to begin to see the greatest days. I'm, I'm not saying it's not rough. I'm not saying it's not uh, madness going on. But the Bible lets us know in Matthew 24, it's not going to end with wars, rumors of wars. It's not going to end in national, uh, natural disasters. not going to end in pestilence. It's going to end in the gospel of the kingdom being preached into all the world. And then the end shall come. The arrow is beyond us, God. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here tonight, you're not right with God. I'll do it real quick. A life without Jesus is a planetary system without the sun. You have nothing to light up your life. You have nothing to direct you, to pull you into the rhythm and the course of the direction, the destiny that God has for you. And what I want you to know is when you get out of harmony with God, life declines. The simplest way I could tell you, when you get out of harmony, when I act in a way that's independent, adversarial, contradicting God and his word. It never has worked out for folks. It never does. And the tragedy of it all is God loves you. He's here for you. If you're right now, you say, Sean, I need to surrender to Christ. I need to give my life to the Lord. I, I've walked away from God. I need to come back. I've been like the prodigal. I need to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know this love that passes all understanding. And I'm telling you right now to drink from the fountain of life bring something in you. This is what Jesus said when he's at the, a well in John 4. He said, anybody drinks from this well will thirst again. But if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink, you would ask me for a drink. And as you would drink, it would become a well in you. That you're not going to be vulnerable to the wells of the singles bar and the websites and what people think about you and reject you and hurt you and harm you. But you'll be able to drink from God in a way that rather than desperate to the world's crack wells, you'll have a well in you that springs up to eternal life. And yes, to know your sins are forgiven. To know that as you repent, that the blood of Jesus covers you. And it's wiped away. You say, Sean, you don't know what I've done. You're right. You don't know what I've done. But the cool thing is what we've done doesn't matter. It's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on a cross. And my ability to come into complete surrender and yieldedness to the Lord of all. If you're here right now, I say, Sean, pray with me. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come to the Lord or I need to come back to Christ. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, slip your hand up. I know it's a Saturday night, but I'm telling you what. Yes, God bless you. Appreciate that. Anybody else says, hey, 
I love that. I love that. Anyone else that would join? I love it. And anyone knows me knows I am ecstatic right now. One person lifted their hand. I'm, you don't know how ecstatic I am. I'm, I'm jumping up and down. All that happened is with your two hands. Come on, I love it. Three hands have gone up. I love it. Okay, no, you're just praising God. Never mind. Two hands are up. <laughs> Can't lift your hand up on an altar call if you're not. Uh, we're going to pray. God bless you too in the back. Let's all pray together. Say this with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you. Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I turn away from attitudes and actions, selfishness and pride, any other thing that would separate me from you. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, for loving me. And I declare tonight, I'm a child of God. I got victory over the enemy. And I will praise you all my days in Jesus' name. Everybody put your hand over your heart. You don't have to pray this after me. I'm going to pray this with you. Father, I thank you. Father, for those two that prayed the prayer and perhaps maybe some others that God, they're using this moment to, if you will, uh, have a, come to, a new come to Jesus moment. And I thank you, God, that you're sealing your love. God, the Bible says in Romans 5.5, 5, you give a hope that does not disappoint. And God, you, you've set your love, lavished your love abroad in our hearts. And I thank you that that hope and that love anchors us in this new life. And I thank you, Jesus, that we're not left to kind of do a self-improvement stuff. They got that stuff on old school barns and noble shelves in the self-help section. I thank you. This isn't a self-help. It's a God help. In fact, it's a God rescue. And Lord, we declare, God, that we will serve you and we will walk with you. So I pray you would break off heartache, trauma, uh, any uh, things that have held us back, any areas where we don't feel free. I just declare freedom and an outbreak encounter of the love of Father God. And I bless these in Jesus' name. Can somebody give the Lord a hand clap, a shout? Krista, you want to come up? We're going to sing a worship song. But we really feel like God is moving. And I do want to start here before we sing. And, and this will be a pray for you while you're in your, your place, uh, your seat. Just stand up where you're at. I, I, I felt like there are people here that have felt overwhelmed, maybe because of the level of warfare or decisions you're having to make. You're feeling a bit stuck in some areas. You feel like you're in this vacuum of knowing kind of the next step, the next place, and feeling like uh, you're in that seat or that stone of Ezel, not knowing that God is about to take this moment to launch you, but you feel in that moment like David where the questions are coming more than the answers, where you're feeling like, I feel there's an old comfort thing, but I, I, I know that God has got something shifting. I'm weary from running and dodging swords and spears. That's spiritual warfare. You can become, uh, uh, how, how would I say, you could become fatigued from battle weary, from the different things that have come at you, but you're needing a fresh breath of God to blow on you. I just want to pray for you right where you're at. That'll be our first, there'll be, I think, about two or three altar calls, all right? But if you're one of those ones, would you just stand up right now? You're saying, Sean, I'm going through a season of question. Sean, I need some answers. I need God to show himself strong. I need to see the arrow of the Lord. I'm battle weary. I got stuff. I feel stuck. Uh, there's uncertainty. There's stuff going on in my life. I feel overwhelmed. If any of these things apply to you, but or if you're you're sensing that shift in your life and you need a direction. Just stand up. Would you put your hand over your heart? And I just want to pray over you. Father, you see, and I, I would say that's probably half of us that are standing. Lord, I thank you, God, that their response, Lord, before their Heavenly Father ensures, God, you're going to show up and show off. Lord, you said, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you did not know. We fall in that Je uh, Jeremiah 33, 3 deal. And so, Lord, we pray, God, right now for clarity. We break confusion and every device of the enemy meant in this point in time to cause them to second guess, question themselves, maybe even question God and what's going on. We pray, Father, right now for a fresh infusion a fresh inspiration of the Spirit of God. I pray, God, that you would open their eyes to see what you're doing, that they would see. David the psalmist himself said, I would have despaired unless I believe I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living, or I've seen the goodness of God. Lord, allow us to see your goodness as you cause the goodness of God to pass before Moses, which was a, a definition of your glory. God, show your glory to your people. 
And I pray for supernatural clarity. Lord, that verse that says, uh, whether you look to the left or the right, you hear a voice saying, this is the way walking in it. I pray supernatural clarity. Some that have felt spiritually dull and hearing the voice of God, I pray God right now, Father, Lord, it, that dullness would just break off. I had a picture a while back, not necessarily right now, though I'm reminded of it, but I had a picture a while back that the Lord showed me. I don't do it often enough. Maybe you didn't do it a little more often, but I had Q-tips and I was kind of going in my ears and was kind of shocked at a level of wax I was bringing out. And I felt like the Lord says, uh, I'm removing the hearing impediments in the body of Christ, then I'm bringing back this ability to hear my voice more clearly. And I think that would apply to many of us here. So Father, uh, Lord, take that spiritual Q-tip, whatever, I know what it represents, but Lord, take that right now and to begin to remove the wax, the buildup, the impediment to the clarity of God. Restore that naoth, restore that Ramah, that we would walk in authority, that we would stay in the prophetic space of revelation. I pray dreams in the night, visions in the day. I pray encounters. I pray breakthrough anointing on your people. Just take a minute right now and just fix your heart and your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus I know there was a whole lot more than what we know, but I, Lord, I, I've always believed and prayed in my heart. God, when you, we know the upper room, but that moment when you breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, I've always thought, I want to know what that feels like. Father, I pray, God, right now, breathe upon my friends that are standing and even us that are sitting. Breathe upon us and whatever was imparted in that moment, Lord, breathe that, God, there would come fresh the, the word inspiration means inspirited. It would be the picture of Jesus breathing. We're saving this. Inspiration, breath of heaven, blow upon these. Lord, we know that the breath of heaven can cause bones to become a standing army. Lord, breath of heaven, breath of life, blow, 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 blow. Winds of God, blow upon your people. Hallelujah. Just breathe in. Just take a deep breath, deep breath. I don't know, worship team. You could just sing a worship chorus over us and just, just stay right there in this place. I just feel like God's about to do something. And beautiful and glorious, matchless in every way, wonderful. And beautiful and glorious, matchless in every way, wonderful. You're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way, wonderful. You're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way, wonderful. You're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way. in every way wonderful beautiful glorious matchless in every way wonderful beautiful glorious matchless in As Sean was ministering tonight, and he hit that vein talking about Fox's Book of Martyrs. 
I felt the anointing in the room and an invitation from the Lord in an area of repentance where we have allowed man's opinions or the sway of our culture to actually affect the footing of our faith. And I felt like there was an invitation tonight to come into a place of Jesus, forgive me where I've allowed people's opinions or the sway of culture to shift my stance, my zeal, my passion, my pursuit of the things of God. Tonight I recommit to stand on the rock that is unshakable and unmovable. We are living in a time that is tumultuous. It requires a fresh footing of our foundation of our faith and i believe god is inviting us as the church to find a fresh strength in our faith this is not the time for wavering faith but the only way that we can have a strengthening of our faith is recommitting our hearts to jesus and that might sound like krista but i love jesus fully but is his opinion the greatest opinion of your life is his actually word the final word in your life and i just feel like god says tonight i'm gonna break off man pleasing i'm gonna break off the fear of man off my church and off my bride and there's an invitation i feel like tonight where god says come to me come to me tonight and just say jesus i recognize i've allowed other things to shake me but tonight lord will you shake off of me the things that have held me back from a radical posture of jesus you're what i live for you're the reason why i get up in the morning you're the purpose in my life i just feel like god's like can i give you a fresh vision for why you're here today can i give you a fresh vision for why you're in the northwest region friends it's not just to have a good old boys club in the church at sunrise it's to win a world that is lost and broken Come on, we gotta get, we gotta get broken for souls again. God is releasing us to bring the gospel to a world that is aching for an encounter, but we can't bring them what we're not rooted in. And I just want you to stand to your feet if you're saying, Jesus, like give me a new base to stand on. I just feel like God says, I'm putting a fresh base underneath you the things that have been shaken and they've caused a shaking of your faith God says I'm repositioning your faith tonight so Lord all over this room if that's you and you're standing for this just put your hands up I just feel like it's a posture of surrender we're letting go of the things that we have found oh come on there's a humility there's a humility I feel like that God is saying, thank you for your humility. Thank you for humility. I just feel like there's some, there's some seasoned saints in the room where you can go, God, I, I know how to stand on you, but I feel like because you just stood, there's a humility of saying, no, no, God, I recognize I, I need to stand differently in this season. So whatever needs to shift, what the, whatever sh needs to shift in my base, God, do it. All over this room right now, God, will you shake off the things that have caused us to cower to the culture of this world. Will you put a strength in us to stand for truth and to stand for righteousness and not be embarrassed about the gospel, but the Parisia, Acts 4.31. God, the Parisia, the infilling of the Holy Ghost that gives us a fresh boldness. Lord, we don't want people that have lived in history to have a greater zeal and a conviction than what we have today. We don't want Fox's Book of Martyrs to be full of people that had a greater conviction. Oh God, put the same conviction that you have done in our ancestors, the hero of faith. Put us in the room tonight, God. Put that same conviction in the room tonight that God, can we give you our lives, all of our lives. We lay our life down for the gospel of Jesus. We don't live for ourselves, but we live for you. All over this room, which is with your mouth, I want you to begin to confess, Jesus, I live for you. Come on. This isn't just like an act of like, 
for fun. This isn't a hype moment. This is a, Jesus, I, I really give you my life. I give you all of who I am. I give you my mouth. I give you my reputation. I give you my social media. Come on, somebody. I give you the gifts and the talents all for your glory, God. Use me for your glory. Use me for your glory all over this room, God. We recommit, we give our lives, no conditions, no holding back, no compartmentalization, God. We give you, we give you our lives fully and completely. God, I call for the fresh surrender in the room right now. I call for the fresh outpouring of surrender in the room where people are saying, Jesus, have your way in my life. Have your way. I want you to respond in the room right now. I don't want you to just listen to me pray. I just feel like God's like inviting us to respond to an invitation of surrender in the room tonight because God is calling us. There's a fresh outpouring to be used by God tonight. Jesus. Jesus. Father, we just declare, God, right now that you would break off us, even though white pray, you would break off of us the fear of man. But Lord, I also pray, God, that there would come a new fear of the Lord and all reverence and empowering recognition of the authority of the all sufficient, all uh, God above every guy. El, El Yon, Lord, we just declare, God, right now, give us a fresh vision of the sovereignty of God over our circumstances and situation. We pray a new awe of God, Lord, in a way that would not just be kind of like a good defense against some sin. Lord, though we need that, but Lord, an awe of God that would put us on the offensive, God, that would put us in a place where we would witness, we would believe and put our faith on the line for miracles. Lord, I, I want more people to, to discard crutches. I want more people to get up out of wheelchairs. Lord, I want to see cancers healed and more people getting up out of stage four cancer. Lord, and the doctors giving death sentences, not putting it on the doctors, but that's the condition they've had to prescribe. Lord, we declare you're the author of life. And God, we pray, God, that, Lord, that, that we would also see more salvations. Lord, and I believe that happens when we grow in the awe of God. Begin to nurture us in the awe of God. Lord, whatever they had in that first century church, we need more of that, God. Lord, we just pray in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus, name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay. There's a lady back there. looks like you, you're t-shirt is black but your shirt on top of is beige or white you have long yes you wave yes you yes 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 what's your name marina all right marina this is metaphor so like i want to preface it but i felt like the lord says you're pregnant now metaphor okay <laughs> you're pregnant with breakthrough but i i kind of had this I don't know that I saw it, but it kind of heard this phrase, uh, you know, and sometimes women can have a blocked fallopian tube that doesn't allow for, I don't know, the egg that may be fertilized to fully get in a place where it needs to be. I don't know enough about that to really give you, but I feel like the enemy's tried to block a breakthrough, Marina, but the Lord right now is removing that blockage. You not only carry a breakthrough for you and your immediate family, but the Lord says that he's going to begin this ministry through you of bringing breakthroughs to others. You carry revival. You carry an intimate heart and a cry for God to see folks set free. And the Lord wants you to know he not only hears those prayers, but the reason why he hears those prayers and the reason why you pray those prayers is God has literally put in your spiritual DNA to be a freedom fire and to bring breakthroughs. When you walk in a room, it's going to shift. You're carrying this aspect of this breaker anointing and the attacks that's been upon you. But I feel like there's been a pervasive attack, even on some family members that's going around that you could visibly see that are unusual. We could all say we have some warfare, we have challenges, but it seems like there's been an unusual aspect of the enemy. And I think in the midst of that, he's trying to get your perspective in a way that would block your pursuit, but the Lord says it will not be successful. It will not be successful. There is favor. There is favor. There is Bel uh, Perizim, the Lord of the breakthrough. There is this amazing 
like explosive detonation that you're going to come into. It's not just something you, uh, in terms of an anointing on your life, yes, but it is an encounter that God is giving to you that you're going to step into this and your cry for deeper intimacy is heard by your heavenly father. It's, it's Marina, right? Lord, we stretch your hands towards Marina. Lord, we thank you for Marina. And God, she just jumped out of the crowd with such highlight that I go, okay, God, amen. I love that. So father, I believe it's even beyond what I'm perceiving. I believe that there is a, a generational level breakthrough that's going to hit her family, her loved ones, that they're going to talk about for some time to come, that that was the shift that they needed. And there's also something that she has become a carrier of, that she's going to see a marked increase of heaven showing up when she shows up. And we thank you that whatever weaponry was used to, to maybe in some sense get you to uh, wonder what's the delay is the delay am, am I, is that dream not going to happen is that thing not of the lord am i just dreaming am i making this up and the lord says no you're not dreaming in terms of a uh, uh, individually uh, uh spawn dream but it's a god and planet dream and you're not making it up god has in fact made you up for this purpose because they're good works that you'll walk in according to Ephesians. So Lord, we bless and we thank you for Marina in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Uh, the gentleman, you're next to the woman with the right what, red M hat on. Yes. Love if you can just hat. step out. Yeah, I love, love it. Love the jacket. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. As I was praying, uh, you just became three-dimensional in the room, and I felt the Holy Spirit come in a swirl around you, and I felt like the Lord says, I'm shifting seasons in your midst. And I felt like the Lord says, it's been a long time coming, son, and it's what you've been praying for. And I felt like the Lord says the time is now and the season has shifted. And we break off disappointment in the waiting and the contending. The Lord says, my faithfulness will mark 2024. But the Lord says, there's restitution for what you've walked through. Restitution is that back pay. And I felt like the Lord says, you're going to see all of it restored, actually in ways that are totally unexpected, but better than you could hope for. And the Lord says, I am the God that restores all. And I felt like even as I'm just laying my hands on you, that there are some areas where you're like, Lord, I don't know how you restore that. There's something like it's, it's not in the natural anymore. It's like it's it feels impossible that that could be restored because it's actually like not present anymore. That's the only way I can describe it. And God goes, I'm st I can restore that too. Like he's going to restore the things that feel like they're not even measurable. They're not tangible. And God says, I am outside of time and you're going to see me restore all the things. Nothing is left out of the word All. Your sleep's going to be restored. So we break off the assignment over your sleep, which has affected you in a lot of ways. So we cancel that assignment in the name of Jesus, and we declare over your body full restoration and the peace of God. Even right now is coming upon you. There's a wave of the peace of the Lord, and that underlying anxiety is broken right now, which is actually a generational curse. We cancel that generational curse in the name of Jesus, and we break it, and we declare freedom over you, anxiety never to return. And we thank you, Jesus, from this day forward, you're going to walk in freedom now. Yes, Lord. Now. Freedom in your mind, freedom in your body, freedom in your emotions, and the Spirit of God within you arise. In the changing of the chapter, the Lord says, you will come out a new man. 
Shikuriana mana makuri de baku shikarabako de baku shikarabaka shiki baha roko shikabaka ka hu de maku shikuri de baku shikarabaka because it's time it's time I just declare the kairos timing of the Lord shikuri de maka and the Lord says say it one more time I declare over you the changing of the seasons has happened. In Jesus' name. <sighs> he has not forgotten her. He has not forgotten her. In the name of Jesus. <sighs> and Herb, I have a word for you. <laughs> Mm. Your steadfast faithfulness of the Lord. I hence the I feel the promotion of the Lord on you. And the Lord says, because you have remained faithful in the unknown and in the liminal space, the in-between space. The Lord says, I am promoting you, son. And he's not only promoting you in the area of authority, he's promoting you the area of perspective and visual. And I saw you being brought up to heavenly places with the Lord, and he was allowing you to see things as he sees them. And I felt like the Lord says, the assignment, part of the assignment over your voice prophetically in this hour, Herb, is to talk about how heaven sees earth. Not how man sees earth, not even how the church sees the world today, but how heaven's perspective is. And the Lord says, because of that, you're going to have many heavenly encounters where he's actually going to bring you up and give you an aerial view, and it comes with report you're to release. And I felt like the Lord said... As your eyes see things you've never seen before, I hear the Lord say, I've never prophesied anything like this before. The Lord says, I will give you a new vocabulary to communicate what you're being shown. You are being shown things that are out of the earthly realm. You will not have vocabulary to communicate it, but the Lord says, I will give it to you so the people understand it. And the Lord says, the Father's heart in you that was prophesied over you in your 20s that your son and your children will walk in a greater portion in what you walk in, the Lord says, I have not forgot my word. So I prophesy it over you, Herb, that your son and your spiritual sons and daughters will walk in greater realms than even you will walk in, but it's what you have been prophesied over, what's what you've carried in your heart in prayer and intercession. And the Lord says, I have not forgotten my word. But I'm, re I'm prophesying it over to you because the Lord says, I want to encourage my son's heart that I've not forgotten my word. You will see the generation, generational blessing of your legacy. And even now, the Lord is going to open your eyes to see the promise of your generation. The generational blessing God has spoken to you, I feel like he's going to give you visions in this season of what's to come. And the Lord says over you that he's positioning you to pastor the pastors. Not just maybe here at sunrise per se, but I'm talking about on a national level. I feel like the Lord says, I'm going to put in a sense, like people that know you and say, you need to get Herb out here. 
And you're going to go to places that need a father's heart. And you're going to speak wisdom and break confusion and give strategy. And it's exactly what they need in order to walk into what God has for them. So the Lord says, get ready as a father to pastors and leaders because I'm going to bring you to closed door meetings, encounters, and you're going to be able to speak a father's heart to them. It's going to bring healing. It's going to be trans- bring transformation. But even as I have my hand, I'm laying my hand on you, I hear unlo- like an unlocking. All around you, I heard, I hear unlock, unlock, unlock. And I just feel like that is doors opening, 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 opening. All around you. The Lord says, I'm bringing you out of the hidden. And even, even as I release I felt like the Lord says, pull him forward. Walk out of the hidden. And you're coming into a place where the Lord is putting you in a place where you're going to be seen for what you carry. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Because the Lord says, I always honor the faithful. Yeah. And you're going to heal father wounds for many leaders in the body of Christ that are leading, but they're leading fatherless. And the Lord says, I'm bringing health back to my church by bringing fathers to love on the sons and daughters. So we thank you, Jesus, for this man of God. We thank you for the prophetic anointing and the office in which he walks in, for the turning of the season, for the coming out of the hiddenness to a place of declaration And lastly, Herb, I humbly submit this to you. I hear the Lord saying, no more hesitation with the word of the Lord. No more hesitation. Because the timing of the Lord is critical with what you carry. There's a timeline on the prophetic anointing you walk on, walk in. And your sleep will be a place of encounter. And lastly, the Lord says, as you wake in the morning, and it's right before that full awake moment, it's that in-between space. The Lord says, pay attention to what I whisper and drop in your spirit in that moment. For that will be a place of clear Like a clear word of the Lord will come in that place. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I think you're sitting down, but you're right here on the aisle towards the back. It's like you got a plaid shirt on, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're back there. Stand up. All right. Along the lines of my little part where I was talking about gluten, it's so funny how God will begin to speak to you. I feel like the Lord says, you're like gluten. And let me explain. I guess gluten is like glue, but I see you being one that is holding uh, some things together. I see some young adults, particularly some males around you, that God is going to give you some things to speak in their life that will help them hold together at a point where the enemy is causing their faith, their families, their hope to disintegrate. But you're going to be like that gluten, if you will, that's going to come hold them together. I see an attraction gift on your life. And I just see these young men gathering to you, and it's like you're going to just begin to see some transformations in some air of some guys that you're going to be pouring into and speaking towards. And I'm telling you what, that can happen on an informal level. That can happen by you preaching or you witnessing. But the Lord just wants you to know you're being called out and marked 
marked to have an impact and a voice that's going to affect some young men around you and some even young adults. I don't want to limit it to young men, but I believe young men in particular. And that God is doing a special thing in you. I feel like God is renewing in you uh, this sense of the summoning of God. God has summoned you in the same way that if you were summoned, that you had to appear in court, that you would receive a summons. Somebody would serve you. I feel like the Holy Spirit is giving you a summons that you're coming before the Lord. And I feel the court of the Lord is this place that God is going to begin to speak to you and give you literally a strategy and a battle plan for this next season that you're stepping into. You have something you're putting your hands to that's kind of part of how you make you, you make do. You make uh, a living. You do that. But I feel like what the Lord is handing you is in an area where uh, there's an expansion of your voice in ministry. So, Lord, I bless this brother. I thank you for the fresh touch of God on you. I thank you, and I give you praise for me in Jesus' name. Right here in this area, uh, there's a guy, a male, that you have acid reflux. You've had an off and on again thing with this upper part of your stomach. My sense is you're in this area, but if you're in this area, we will pray for you. You know, it's one of those things you know apart, prophesy apart. But my first draw was right here in this area, uh, a burning uh, right here up in the upper area. I saw a picture of a woman. Your hand was on your jaw, but actually, the more I just dialogue with the Holy Spirit, I don't, I, I don't mind praying for someone separate that has TMJ. But I feel for you, sis, that there's some sort of gums or root canal or tooth thing that's going on in the back part. Uh, is that you right here? Amen. Okay, you're right here in this area. Who is the guy, I believe you're in this area, that you have acid, ref, acid like reflux thing. You're a male. If you're over here, well, okay, right here. Okay, so the gal's right there, the guy's right there. If you just step out in the aisle, you, you, you step out. If we can just get someone that will come place your hand upon my brother and someone who would join with my sister right there in her jaw. If you, you're okay, sir, put your hand right there on his like. Uh, solar plexus area. Yeah, that's kind of where it's at. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, that, what is it, Psalms 107, verse 20, you sent forth your word to heal. I just believe that simply by them responding to the word, that healing already broke out. And Father, we just declare, I want to pray for my sister first. I just speak to her gums, her jaw, her roots, all of that in that side of her mouth. And we just say, uh, pain, go. Uh, infection or anything that would affect it, leave, healing, come in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that these signs will follow them that believe as our sister is laying hands on your mouth. Healing virtue, healing power is flowing into that side of your mouth. And God is John G. Lake, who is from this region, would often pray in, with healing. He said, the law of the spirit of life sets you free from the law of sin and death. So we release healing virtue into your jaw. We pray over our brother right now. And there is an anointing on you, sir. You are a, in many respects, a pillar that people can depend on and lean on. And, and you are that way for, for some people around you that, that uh, literally uh, you are someone that, that's it. You're someone that they can lean on. You're a pillar. Father, I just declare God right now, acid reflux, that flap that opens and maybe doesn't close right, whatever. God, we just declare that thing opens and closes as it should. We declare the burning goes right now. We just break it off of you right now. We just declare healing virtue, healing power. Lord, we declare, God, right now, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, forget none of his benefits, pardons all our iniquities, heals all our diseases. And we thank you, God, that by your stripes, Jesus, he's made whole. So we just declare shalom of heaven comes to this portion and right now, three, just take a deep breath, sir. One, two, three. Breathe in right there. Take a deep breath. There it is. Father, and you can breathe out, Lord. Flood him. Flood him. Keep your hand there. Just continue to minister. Is there a, a, an Andrea or an, Andrea? Andrea? Is that name mean something to somebody? If you got to go like, hey, it's somebody I, I grew up with. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I would, it's either your name, middle name, or immediate family member name. But I just kept hearing Andrea or Andrea. Who's that to you? Okay, stand up, bro. That's awesome. You, this, this is like bonus day, bro. You can't walk away with two words. I, I, uh, I want to sometimes, and don't read it in the wrong way, but I just felt like the Lord says course correction for Andrea. Course correction. And I just think about sometimes on my uh, Waze app, sometimes 
I, it's directing me to go a certain place and I missed my turn or I, I went opposite. I should have turned right, turned left. And it does a course correction. I felt like the Lord says he's doing a course correction right now for your sister. And there is the grace of the Lord. There's prayers that have gone up that have been heard from by the Most High. And a merciful father loves his girl. He loves his daughter. And there is this thing where sometimes it's decisions we make. Sometimes it's a situation where something fell on our lap and, and, and we had to do the best of what we could do with what we had. But God's saying, I'm doing a course correction. So lift your hands. You're in Lou and Andrea. And I'm saying that right? Andrea, Father, we declare right where Andrea is at tonight, whether she stands, sits, kneels, lays down, wherever she's at tonight, that there is a, 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 a literally a, a visitation of heaven, an encounter of God. That is a word's being released at Sunrise Christian Center in this this place is being remodeled, that there's a course correction right where Andrea is at. And Lord, we thank you that God, you would call her by name to let he, him know and for the word to come to her that God sees. It's like Jehovah Ro, Rohi, Rohi that was at Hagar in the midst of the wilderness thinking her and her, her child uh, is going to die, Ishmael, and all of a sudden a well appears and all of a sudden, it's like, God, you see me. And the Lord wants you to know he sees you. He sees your family. And there's an incredible thing that's taking place. And God is saying, the course correction has begun now in Jesus' name, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Just put your eyes on Jesus. Isn't he just so good and so faithful? You know, as God's just ministering in the room, what I love is he can be ministering to you just at your seat right now. He's whispering things to you, like just keep that place of engagement with the presence of God just right where you're at because when the Holy Spirit's hovering in the room and moving in the room, I just love he can be ministering to all of us at the same time. You know, there's these uh, two couples, uh, one, two, third row, you have the striped sweater on and the plaid, just the two of you stand, and then right catty corner right behind you, uh, this couple uh, right here with the plaid shirt. Yes, you two, if you guys can stand. Um, I just felt like, it was interesting, I don't know if you guys even know each other, you're friends, but I felt like, well, you're married, but the couple behind you. Um, <laughs> Yep, I'm on it. I'm on it. Not always the sharpest tool, but that one I called. That, that one I had figured out. But I felt like the Lord, um, over the two of you, I felt like the Lord says, I'm visiting their homes. And so I just want you to put out your hands because I felt like actually the power and the presence of the Lord, there's a sweet presence that's about to be released upon the two of you, two couples. And I just felt like the Lord says, as I'm resting upon you, there's a portion that's going to get released tonight that you're taking home to your families. And I feel like you've been asking the Lord for more. You've been going, God, there's more. There's more for our family. Lord, there's more that we're to walk in. There's like deeper waters we're to tread in. And the Lord says deeper waters are here and I just felt like the Lord is literally like increasing where you've been like waist deep right it's about to go over your head I just feel like you're getting immersed tonight in the in the sweet presence of the Lord and I just felt like the Lord says miracles come with immersion miracles come with the immersion I just felt like as you're being immersed into the presence of the Lord there's miracles that are going to follow the four of you. And I just feel like the Lord says tonight, receive the impartation of the miraculous and receive the impartation of the deep places. So Jesus, we pray over these couples for a fresh outpouring. Pour out your presence, Jesus. Ooh, there it is. I just feel this wave of his presence. If you're in the room and you feel that, I just want you to receive that. And even if you don't feel it, but you're receiving it by faith, that's wonderful. Just receive that by faith. If you're like, hey, that's my word too. Like, I, re I received that, Krista. That God's saying that to me. Amen. Receive that word. There's, there's an impartation for the deeper places in the spirit. Lord, I thank you that they're going to walk in a way where people marvel and say they've been with Jesus. Lord, isn't that how we want to be when people look at us and they go, wow, they've been with Jesus. 
Lord, I thank you that these couples are going to be ones that people look and go, they've been with Jesus. So, Lord, we bless their home. We ask for an impartation in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to stop right here. Fresh, 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 fresh. Just deep waters, deep, 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 deep. Deep, deep waters, deep waters. If I can just grab your hand. Yeah, deep waters. Now, more, more, more right there. Yes, Jesus. Fresh, fresh, fresh waters, fresh waters. If you can just put your hands on, on his shoulder right there, just stamp it. Yeah, right there. Fresh impartation, impartation. There's an impartation. That's right. There's an impartation, impartation. The old is gone. The deep waters, the deep waters, the deep waters. Receive it, receive it, receive it. All over this room, I just feel, feel like there's an invitation for the deep water. So Jesus, those that are longing and craving and say, Jesus, I know there's more. I, I'm longing to walk in the deep places. God, will you just raise the water around us right now? If it's been ankle deep, take it to knee. If it's been knee, take it over our heads. Jesus, we just ask for deep waters to be imparted in the room tonight, Lord. That you take us to the deep places and the people encounter us and they literally walk away going they've been with Jesus oh they've been with Jesus Lord all over this room take us to the deep deep places just real quick uh, my brother right here in a white hat right in front real short but but succinct number one I'm almost certain last time we were here you were you were here a year ago right you probably said okay Number one, I, I felt like, and, and kind of, I, I talked about it with the men, or no, I talked about tonight when you kind of go through a growth spurt where you're kind of awkward a little bit. I just see that there's been a unique growth. It's like the Lord marked you like uh, Ezekiel, and you stepped out into this river, and God has measured you for increase. And I just see an increase of authority, an increase of uh, influence. Uh, you know, a lot of people are trying to be influenced, and they think if they can get a couple extra followers on you know, Instagram, that makes them an influencer. No, no, no. It, it, your ability to yield and wield influence is based on you using it for God and what God has put on you. You're doing a great job of that. But this is the part that I really want to hit. I, I felt like what is about to happen to you is God is putting a new fire on you. Like I literally saw you ablaze Kind of like that dude on Fantastic Four, you know. I watch some of the Marvel movies, right? I think they're going to come out with a new Fantastic Four. But I just remember this dude going, flame on, right? I, I just feel like the Lord says, with my son, it's flame on. And the flame of the Lord is going to come upon you. And I don't know if you're doing this now and don't. You allow it to be organic as God would do it. But I see you outside preaching. I see you open air preaching. I see the word of the Lord coming out of your mouth. Some of it may be a planned outreach where you go into some areas some people around you, y'all go up a flatbed truck, begin to preach the gospel. But I think there are going to be some spontaneous moments where just the word of the Lord is going to come. To, I remember this happened to me in Gear Deli Square and Pier 39. I stood up in the midst, I stood on a psychic, in front of a psychic woman's table and preached the gospel to people that were waiting in line and had some people get saved. But... I didn't do it to be obnoxious or anything. It was just something welled up inside of me, and I could not resist. And you're going to have those kind of moments as well. And again, uh, I feel like this. There's there are aspects of revelation that you receive of God in different seasons, based on kind of this nutrient. They they've done this study and found out that Mama's milk does exactly what that infant needs including if the infant is sick, it actually changes the biological release of what's inside the, the consistency and constituency of mama's milk to meet that need. And I feel like it's a picture of the father. I don't know your relationship with your earthly dad, but in this next season, uh, heavenly father is about to release something so profound in you that is going to just be releasing, healing, it's this thing where Jesus, before he did anything, comes up out of the water. This is my son who I'm well pleased. 
and he launched ministry from that point. And I just see Heavenly Father speaking over you, going, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Get ready, bro. The fire, the word of the Lord, the revelation, souls, souls, souls. There's a prophetic evangelistic thing on you. That thing of being able to call out gold in the midst of the dirt is just going to go to new levels and an accuracy it is going to be amazing what God's going to do in and through you, man. Love you, dude. That's awesome. Faster John. Awesome. Okay. I, I, I will say this. My wife is ran it back to fast. Uh, the cool thing about being in the wine press is that's where wine is made. And I think there's some of you that have been in a wine press and the Lord just wants to encourage you. And at any point in time, however Pastor John leads us, I, I just want to believe right now that anyone that has felt like a discouragement in the season they're in would be encouraged because we're on a threshold moment. We're on the stone of Ezel. We're on a place where God is about to launch us into a fresh season. So, Father, we just declare over all those that are listening, there's anyone that's been discouraged. They've been in that wine press. But the cool thing about being in the press is that's where wine is made. We all want new wine, but no one wants to be in a wine press, God. But, Lord, we all want to be have new oil, but no one wants to be in that crucible or whatever that thing is where you smash the olives and you get the oil, however that works. But Father, I thank you that we are a people that say yes, and because of that, we can have the, the new wine and the fresh oil needed for the season. So that's what I pray. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for new wine to flow and fresh oil to anoint your people, and that, God, that you would mark us, and the Lord, that this would really be an encounter season. Even uh, you would shock us and surprise us in ways that you would show up and places you would show up. And that, God, just in the same way that we may be used to the arrow landing on the side of us, you're going to shock us with the arrow landing in a different place because the arrow is beyond us, which means, God, you're leading us into this new place and new season and new release in God. And so I bless your people in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we just thank the Lord for their ministry tonight? And I just want everybody to stand up together. Lord, we thank you tonight for your ministry to us. Through your spirit, through your servants, through our time of worship and prayer. I really sense that as a couple times when Sean and Krista talked about Fox's Book of Martyrs and about paying a price in a season of risk, depth, caring for the lost, paying a price for the gospel. There was an anointing that was stirring up corporately. I believe over sunrise, it's a word for us. I believe it's also for others of you from other churches and other ministries as well. But I wanna give you a chance to respond corporately just to come to the altar. If you felt the weightiness of God is like, no matter what it costs me, if it costs us our life, it's, we gotta, the Lord was speaking to me this week that we've got to take out what he's doing in here. If we give away what, we'll ha what we have, he'll give us more. But if we hold on to it, we're going to lose it, right? We're going to lose it. And he wants to multiply what he's doing, but it comes through people that will lay down their lives no matter what it costs. So I'm asking you to come. Just come. You're saying, I felt the weight of the Lord. I felt the anointing of God, a stirring for souls, a stirring for risk, that I'm, I'm willing to pay the price. Some of you have ministries, anointing gifts, and the Lord is even saying, put it on the altar. Put it on the altar. If the Lord wants to do something new in this season, in my life, Lord, it'll be uncomfortable. It'll cost me. It's a risk. It's time to step out. God's speaking to some of us that have been used significantly even of the Lord that it, it could be a new season of cost, a new, a new season of paying the price, of going into the unknown and not being afraid, letting go of the comfort as you heard because you can't launch and hold on to comfort the whole time right? So Lord, we just thank you. You guys can start to minister to the Lord worship team. I'm not start, but continue <laughs> to just lead in song. But Lord, we Jesus, we say yes. We say yes, no matter what it costs. And uh, 
I don't know if Sean and Krista have any gas left in the tank. If you want to just put your hands on people or pray for people if you're good. If you, uh, but whenever you need to go because you're ministering tomorrow, you feel free to slip out. But uh, and, uh, any of our other, I know a bunch of our pastors and prayer team, they're up at the altar right now, uh, right? But if you're not, then you can put, that you can help us pray <laughs> for others, all right? But come on, Lord Jesus. I don't, yeah, just lift up your voice to him. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Receive my life. Holy fire, holy fire, holy fire. Holy fire, holy fire, mark, mark, mark us tonight, mark us tonight, divine encounters, Lord God, no matter what it costs, the lamb is worthy, Jesus is worthy.